It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 317 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 18th of November 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. Now before we start, I've got something that I need to say. We lost a very dear friend and a listener to the show this week. Uh, Penelope Green was a huge supporter of science, scepticism, critical thinking. In particular, she championed evidence-based medicine. But after an eight or nine year battle with lung cancer, she passed away on Tuesday. And it's been a pretty rough few weeks for us. Uh, As I said, she was a listener to Science on Top, as well as a very good friend. And to that end, we've decided we're going to donate all the Patreon contributions we get for the next 10 episodes to two of her favourite charities, the Fred Hollows Foundation and Doctors Without Borders. Um, So that's going to start next week. So if you're already a subscriber and you object to that plan, now's the time to cancel your contribution. Alternatively, if you're not a Patreon supporter and you want to help us honour Penelope's memory, We'd be very grateful for your help there. Scienceontop.com slash donate to uh, sort that out. But we're going to move on and we are going to start the show talking about dark matter. So, Lucas, using data from the European Space Agency's Gaia Space Telescope, scientists have determined that there's a dark matter hurricane storming past Earth. However... Live science informs me I don't need to worry because it's mostly, quote, a bunch of normal dark matter with especially good branding. (laughs) So what's all this about? (laughs) Well, I thought there was, I wonder if there's some sort of nature news headline about it as well. It's, it's, it's okay. Dark matter is natural. Oh, yeah. Um, So natural news, not (laughs) nature news. Nature news is the good one that's done by Nature Science Journal. But natural news. Natural news is sorry, the my bad. Woo infested piece of crap. <laughs> the uh, good one. <laughs> I call it a um, Yeah, yeah, no, I've got no problem with that whatsoever. Yes, so yes, normal dark matter. Just the normal dark matter that we don't know what it is. <laughs> it's just that. Um, I actually love this one because I didn't know that's that dark matter storms were a thing. Um, I kind of a little bit surprised considering how much I read. Uh, about astronomy that I hadn't come across dark matter storms before. Um, and not only are there a thing, but we're in one. Um, so that's that's very, very interesting. So taking this back a step, um, we, f- we do feel we – I'm putting – I'm using the we as in <laughs> myself and the, and the scientific community uh, – we feel that dark matter plays a pretty important role in the formation of galaxies. Um, It seems to be important for galaxies in order to keep them from flying apart. So uh, dark matter is, generally speaking, is is something that that we're we're for. We're we're for dark matter. Um, We don't object to it. Um, But uh, what what we what we do know, apparently, which was news to me this week, is that um, uh, projects such as the Gaia mission, um, have have spotted quite a few dark matter. They call them dark matter streams um, are in the cosmos, and and quite a few in the Milky Way. And these are regions that have the telltale telltale signs of dark matter, which are measured predominantly through their interactions with other things, i.e., their gravitational interactions with other things. So if we oh, we've done stories in the past, for example, about dark matter um, patches of the sky that were sort of offset from their, their galaxies that they should belong to. Uh, and that's really interesting in and of itself. But in this case, what would likely cause these dark matter streams are the Milky Way having previously 
merge with aka gobbled up depending on which website you're reading <laughs> um uh, other galaxies, galactic clusters, nebula, you know that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, as as that's happened, it's it's we've ended up with these bits of dark matter that that weren't originally part of our galaxy that are that are now, you know, in various various patterns and 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 various uh, trajectories across the sky. Now, the trajectories are interesting because the trajectories tell us. They they tell us a little bit about where, you know where they've come from and which direction they've come from, which is kind of cool. Particularly if those uh, dark matter streams are travelling in a in a different um, direction or velocity to the sur- the surrounding background stars. Uh, it's also interesting looking at the composition of any stars that are in that stream as well, because that tells us a bit about the origin and the age of the stars as well. So if there's a stream that that appears against the background of Milky Way stars and then we find that the stars that are in that stream or in and around that stream appear to be of quite different makeup than the background stars, then that also tells us that those stars probably came also from the galaxy or the galactic cluster or whatever, uh, the dwarf galaxy or whatever it may have been, that we gobbled up, which, again, is kind of cool because this stuff, to me, really kind of um, lends credence to the potential for things like panspermia-type theories, you know, where um, if if life did seed somewhere, if life began somewhere, then there, there's, there's sufficient movement of matter around not just our own galaxy, but between galaxies to open the possibility for, for that sort of thing to occur. And panspermia, of course, is the the, uh, the idea that maybe, you know, if life evolved on in, in one place, could interactions between that place and other places, normally it's in terms of planets, cause life to spread, you know, throughout the uh, solar system and the galaxy and so forth. So that, that's really cool. Um, so this particular story relates to a recently detected stream, which they've called S1. Um, and that stream, that stream is, uh, is, is of, of particular interest to these scientists because, as you mentioned in the intro, we're inside of it. Um, it's actually passing through our solar system at the moment, and we'll continue to do some. Uh, we'll continue to do some uh, so for quite some time. I, I'm having problems with so. Um, well, because it's my, probably the dark matter. It's affecting me. I thought it was um, breezy outside. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're in a dark matter storm. It appears storm is a is a, a hurricane. Know, is perhaps. A hurricane, no less. <laughs> I know it kind of evokes sort of Sharknado type <laughs> of imagery, but um, there's no sharks. Dark there's Nado. N- <laughs> dark, dark, no. no. <laughs> See, they missed an opportunity with headlines there, dude. Oh, man, that's so good. I, I can't believe I didn't think of that. That's fantastic. well done. There, there you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that's why this is interesting uh, because we're we're actually in it, and 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 it's felt that um, this gives us you know uh, more of an opportunity to study it because it you know it's really up close uh, and personal. Um, but you know when you're talking about a thing that doesn't interact with anything around mm. it apart from through gravity, um, the 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 benefit here is that we can potentially look at things that are much closer to us and see how the gravity of the dark matter is affecting them. Um, I don't know how much that really helps us in the big scheme of things because one of the things that you you want to see is you, you want to see um, a, a big difference between an object and the other objects against the background. So I guess that's the the real key here that if we've got dark matter in our vic- in our vicinity in our you know galactic vicinity. <laughs> um, then, then objects that are closer to us, stars that are closer to us and so forth, might be affected by that gravity in, in the way that you would expect them to be anywhere in the galaxy that you know there was enough dark matter nearby. But because they're so close to us, there's an apparent, you know, the apparent distance between those objects and the ones in the background is much, much greater. Mm-hmm. And once you start to see those, you know, there's very large distances between things, then apparent motion can become much easier to detect. So... That's that's I guess the exciting part about it. But for me, it was just enough to to learn that there were these 
dark nados. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think that's really, really cool. So to sort of uh, drill down on this, we haven't actually seen, obviously we haven't detected the, these dark matter hurricanes. We haven't seen evidence of them. Is that we're just sort of inferring that that dark matter would be there because we've seen these streams of stars passing. Is that right? Yes, exactly right. So because of the the interaction with the things around it, we we know that there's you know that there's a lot of gravity in these sort of in a in a stream pattern that we've observed throughout the galaxy multiple times. Apparently, didn't know that was a thing, um, but mm-hmm. but yes, within the galaxy there are these other streams, and um, and that's. That's assuming. Uh, I mean, we've got to we've got to bear in mind, of course, that dark matter is a placeholder, right? We don't know what it is. There's a whole lot of uh, there's a whole lot of uh, potential uh, candidates if if we're looking at it from a particle perspective. Um, you know, wimps come to mind as one of the the, the explanations. These weak weakly interacting interacting massive particles which basically means they're particles that have mass but they don't interact very much with things around them so we've got all sorts of detectors on earth that are trying to capture these wimps or whatever they may be and 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 um ascertain what they you know what where they fit into particle physics but yes we can infer the existence of these streams and the existence of dark matter patches in the sky because of their interaction with around them which is similar in a way to um to how we find um black holes you know we we can't directly image them um but we we do see their effects and if they're feeding that's even more so sure yeah uh the other cool thing about this is that they've predicted that it's blowing this dark matter this dark nato (laughs) past us really fast like 500 kilometers a second uh, yeah, three hundred and ten miles per second. Uh, but no one cares about miles. Let's be honest, because it means nothing to us, unless you're in the US. Yeah, in which case you're going. What are these kilometers? <laughs> Metric people, get on board. Well, <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned the <laughs> system. <laughs> How's that for a second? I know. It's uh, so we could not have scripted that better if we'd tried. <laughs> and we actually didn't script it. That we didn't. No. Natural. <laughs> But, Penny, you know what they say, when is a kilogram not like a kilogram when its weight is determined by the amount of electrical current going through an electromagnet used to lift it? Uh, no, I don't think anyone actually says that either. I was gonna what say am I talking team. about? <laughs> <laughs> Being, you know, an Australian and using the metric system, it's sort of... I always have personally think, yeah, it's really sensible. It's really superior. Not like the stupid old imperial system where like an inch is the king's thumb or, you know, <laughs> a cubit is someone's elbow. Like you can see how much I don't know about these systems. You know, the metric system is scientific and logical, but it, it's actually not in a way. So it's great because everything's, you know, a multiple of 10. So that's nice and easy. But the actual units themselves are actually sort of, as random as the king's thumb so i think the meter is what is it like a millionth of the distance between the poles or something like that like um oh okay maybe not a millionth i think it's some unit like that and everything is um there's a degree of of arbitrariness there's definitely a degree of arbitrariness and so the kilogram, and I did actually know this because it was in one of those you know fun fact books that you have as a kid is actually defined it's a particular, there's a standard block of metal that's kept somewhere in France. Um, I think what was the metal, iridium and something else, so something really hard that is a kilogram. And this has been since 1889. So this modern block of metal that weighs a kilogram is the definition of a kilogram. It's There's no kind of universal, or there hasn't been until now a sort of a universally agreed way of defining it based on some kind of universal constant because if you say oh okay well a kilogram is how much a liter of water weighs well at what temperature at what height Mm -hmm. above sea level Mm -hmm. so you have to be really quite um specific it is ballpark um the mass of a cubic decimeter of distilled water at four degrees um so that's what it's been. But this also depends on the meter. 
So if you're talking about a decimeter, that's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Now, obviously, this is as awkward in a way as the, um, the older systems of measuring, which have the advantage of being in kind of very human relatable units. Like even though I grew up with metric, I'd still find, you know, five foot seven mm. easier mm. to comprehend than 173 centimeters or whatever it is. Like yeah. I've heard that that's a very mm. Australian thing. In my to, travels, people are like yeah. really surprised that we, we tend to, in our culture, think of heights of people, mm. particularly in feet, but every, like everything any, anything else. that's laying on the ground, we think of in meters. Like it's it's kind of weird. So yeah, it's not not just the Americans that are freaky and weird. It's us as well. Isn't it? <laughs> oh, like it's all freaky and weird and arbitrary. And I think that when I do my valiant best to try and explain what a kilogram actually is, you'll see how arbitrary. <laughs> It is and how difficult I find this to do. So instead of saying, oh, okay, well, a kilogram is the weight of this block of metal in a vault in Paris, we can actually think, well, what's a sort of a, a really precise way we can define it based on natural constants? And this is hard to do because to do this, we have to be able to measure those constants really, really accurately. So... The new definition of a kilogram, and I'm looking at the article on the conversation to really <laughs> help me with this. It uses the measurement um, Planck's constants, which is six point, roughly 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Right. I don't know Give what a take a second bit. is. Give or take a bit. <laughs> yeah, which is much more um, human relatable. You're right. So <laughs> relatable. relatable. Um, anyway, apparently this is this is found by dividing the amount of energy a particle of light or a photon carries by its electromagnetic frequency. Of course. <laughs> so, and people I, people do sort of arrive at slightly different numbers when they do that in their heads, <laughs> I've found, you know, in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. So this is a constant. This is something... We can all agree on nothing's going to change it. No bits are going to accidentally get chipped off. So this is um, being used now to define the kilogram. And this has been done with other units. Um, I think meters have been defined as oh, like how much in relation to the speed of light. So how much it travels in a fraction of a second um, is a meter. And I just think this is interesting because obviously in a way, like life is not going to change for me because of this. And I'm guessing for the vast majority of science that is done, it's probably not going to change either. But apparently it will have a bit of a flow on effect. Um, it's breaking a link that the kilogram has had. So, for example, if you think about the mole, which is a number of particles um, of something in a substance. I mean, that is now no longer linked to kilograms and so on. So I just think it's, it's kind of, um, one of those really abstract things that is interesting. I guess if you're a sort of a scientist or if you're someone who works in very, very precise, exact measurements, this is going to be quite significant, hopefully helpful. Um, for everyone else, I mean, Kilogram is still a kilogram, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. a very small. T like it, I don't think it actually really changes the. I don't think it the, changes the weight of a yeah. kilogram or something. Because I mean, that if you start messing with that, you're going to screw every mm. sort of calculation that relies on a kilogram off everything. Uh, yeah. So the kilogram or that uh, sample that in mass France mass still yeah. weighs one kilogram. A kilo. It's how we calculate it that is changed. Mm. And that is now that we use uh, these really super accurate scales called yeah. Kibble Balance, um, named after the research scientist, Dr. Brian Kibble. Uh, and these are a way of measuring something precisely anywhere in the world kind of a thing. Yeah, you don't have to get into this circular thing of, oh, it's, it's the weight of this particular metal block, which is the same weight as, you know, 10 cubic deciliter, decimeter, yeah. deci or, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, so, like the, yeah. the way it's currently done now is you'll have this sample in mm. France in a vault somewhere that is the, uh, the sample, base sample. The kilogram. But everyone, you know, around the world there are these it's replicas yeah. that are essentially the same weight, but they're going to vary by, you know, 
a few grams here and there, sort of a thing, just because well, they can't not be a few exact. Grams, but yeah, well, grams is a big variant. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a bit, bit over the top. Okay. But yeah, Actually, I mean, you're, no, you're right. I'll, you're right. The fluctuation is about fifty parts in a billion, so less than the weight of a single eyelash. Yeah. But that's but still. You know, I'm sure for some stuff that's yeah kind of significant. Important. Yeah, especially when you you happen to be wearing eyelashes. I mean, <laughs> that's straight out the window. Then you're you're we, out by one. Which we laugh, like, but I bet it. you that someone's PhD project involves oh, that's that. Probably <laughs> a thing. It's like weighing eyelashes to to count the number of eyelashes. You know, that's probably a thing. Um, but but I was quite surprised to read that. I mean, it makes total sense. But I was surprised to read that things like just the build up of 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 um, oxidization or mm. from from grime building up on the thing just from being touched by a human or indeed any other animal um <laughs> you know le- leaving you know Oil. any oils on it yeah. all of these things will will impact this official measure which is why it is you know as you said ed it's in this this controlled environment mm. so and and it kind of i guess intuitively you think well if there's all these replicas around the world, it's not like this particular one matters all that much, but but there are going to be differences between them, like mm-hmm. things that are beyond the measurement capabilities we had at the time that that replica was cast, for example. So yeah, I, 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 it makes sense to 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 bring it back to a a thing that is that is you know unmoving and certain, which. I'd love to say the Planck constant is, but you know, there's been a little bit of uh, controversy about that in, in in recent years as well. It's like, is the Planck constant are you actually the world's smallest measure? Uh, we don't know. I, I mean, I've, no, I've never seen one personally, so I can't, you know, pass judgment. You've probably seen lots. You just all jumbled up together, and it looked like one really, really big Max Planck constant thing. <laughs> um. <laughs> As I said, I've never seen one. Oh, very good. Well, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, the other really cool thing about this is these kibble scales and this new way of measuring it is going to be accurate, to, uh, is going to have an accuracy of 0.000001%. So that's zero with five zeros after the decimal point, 1%. That's pretty accurate. That's Going to be good enough for the next few decades of eyelash measuring, I would imagine. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so it's it's cool, yeah. and it it's one of those things that we don't think about often. How we've come to deciding what is a kilogram, what is a meter, what all these things are. It's sort of like how we have to every so often add an extra second to the year, this leap second thing, to get all the mm-hmm. atomic clocks and everything matching. The actual time. Yeah, yeah. Which, which in in pre-industrial, pre, you know, technological mm. society, just didn't matter. No, it, it really cares? didn't. Yeah. It, now, now it could actually put you off on your GPS by a few meters. You know, it's it's a big deal now. If you're into meters, you know, <laughs> as defined. <laughs> anyway, I today I learned about a mole. I didn't know a mole was a thing. Mm-hmm. I, I I thought a mole was just an animal. <laughs> no. no, and I M-O-L. can even remember yeah. the number of moles equals mass over molar mass, like all these little formulae that yeah, and rely on knowing how many parts. Yeah, millimoles and Avogadro's number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and let's go back in time now. Mm. And talk about Neanderthals. And usually, Penny, when we do, we're talking about savage brutes, these uncultured, violent savages. Firstly, why do you think we've given them that, I guess you'd call it a a stereotype? And how accurate is it now, do we think? Look, I feel like that's someone's PhD thesis, and no doubt has (laughs) been, is, you know, why has this popular conception of Neanderthals um, come through? I think they were stockier than modern humans so you know thicker skulls bigger brow ridges and so on but I mean they also lived in sort of ice age Europe where that's a real survival benefit um and you know they didn't survive and history is written by the winners which I'm sure is a really exactly way of summarizing it no but it's true but I mean, we probably went well they have smaller brains so they were not as civilized and cultured as we are 
Do they? I think they had bigger brains. Yeah, I would not. Look, I might be wrong, so I look forward to a flood of <laughs> emails saying, Penny, you're so wrong. But I think they might have actually had bigger brains. And there are, you know, there's some really slight faint signs that they had what we would consider like culture, like they may have made, may have made jewellery or there's one case of a what seems to be perhaps a burial with flowers put on the grave. Which, you know. So they did have bigger brains, you're right. They did have bigger brains. Yep. Yep. But I'm sure there's someone like, oh, yeah, but we were smarter. Yeah. We used our brains better. We we used them better. (laughs) It's it's not what you've got. It's It's not not the size. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And if you, like, you know, obliterate another entire species, well, then... Tops. No, sorry, that was... If, <laughs> if we did, we don't know why they went. Extinct. We don't know about it. <laughs> We've gone so off track. I know, okay. Were their lives more violent? Now, apparently up till now, a lot of studies have shown, you know, they've looked at... Because you can see in archaeological evidence, like on bones, evidence of violence and trauma, whether that trauma's healed. So, you know, if I've broken my arm and then lived for another 20 years with it, that's going to look very different in terms of healing and bone structure than if I broke my arm and then just died a few weeks later of sepsis or something. Um, It shows you where the people have been injured and so on. And apparently a lot of the um, studies have looked at sort of Neanderthal injuries and then looked at the injuries that we see in modern humans and gone, oh, you know, looks like the Neanderthals are really a bit more violent, having a bit more of a tough time. Now, this might be an unfair comparison. In fact, it probably is because we face, not living in Ice Age Europe, we face sort of a huge amount of different kinds of um, dangers. There's no woolly mammoth or whatever around, and I realise that I'm just doing stereotypes, but there are cars and guns that they weren't exposed to. So this recent study compares Ice Age Neanderthals to Ice Age um, anatomically modern humans and what it's found is it actually looks like there's not a lot of um, statistical difference in terms of head injuries between both of them so where these head injuries were caused it seems to have been reasonably easy even between ancient humans and ancient Neanderthals so essentially life was pretty rough in that area mm. No matter who you were, you were more likely to get injured if you're a male, possibly because of sort of cultural roles and things that males did that females tended not to do. Um, And, yeah. So so they could have still been uh, savage, violent brutes. Mm. It's just that so So were were humans. (laughs) Everyone was at that, as was the style of the time. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Very but good. what they did find is that um, if they did have head trauma, Neanderthals were more likely to die before the age of 30 than humans. So this couldn't have a few differences. It could mean that they were more likely to get injured younger or they were more likely to die after they got injured or that our ancestors were better at looking after um, injured humans than Neanderthals were or valued that and so on. So I wonder if there were any structural differences in their brains that mm. made certain head trauma more, more more yeah more impactful you know what i mean on, mm. on in terms of their survivability rates like if motor functions towards the back of the head or something and that gets injured when they yeah. blow and then they can't move or something yeah yeah uh, that's that's uh Making me think, how how would we know what they're... I, I was going to say, see... that's something that we're never really going to be able to figure out. No. Yeah, because it's not like we can stick a Neanderthal in an MRI and say, okay, now just think about something that, uh, that scared you. Uh, <laughs> it's not, we can't do that. But I, I guess it comes back to common ancestors and so So that's just fascinating to think about. Mm. Mm. And that's all we can do is think about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But I, I was amazed that... That that would, had been the comparison up until now. Hmm. It, it, like, it, it would make sense that they compared Neanderthals with modern humans, assuming the modern humans they were comparing them with were the ones who were there at the time, living in the same, you know, situation hmm. and the same conditions. It never occurred to me they were comparing it to modern human populations now. That's just daft. That just seems obvious, surely. Am I the only one who's thinking 
really? Huh? Did someone just say, guys? Um, I don't know. It just seems pretty obvious to me. The other thing that struck me was I have had the impression in most of the time we've been doing this show that these stereotypes have definitely been changing mm. a lot. Oh, they have. That Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's probably the last 10 years or so when we first of all started discovering that we share some DNA with them, uh, a, a tiny amount, sure. But And it's also when we started finding cave paintings and evidence of ceremonies and rituals and stuff that we started to go, maybe they weren't just stupid barbarians. Yes. They were cultured and had, yeah. And nuanced. Yeah. <laughs> it just seemed to flow as a sentence. Sure. I'll run with yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's our show. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 317. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. Starting next week, we'll be donating all the contributions for the next 10 episodes to Penelope Green's favourite charities. So make a decision if you want to go ahead with that or not in the next week or so. Thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Dark matter. Yeah. I just don't understand it. It's one of these things where you're told, okay, it's most of the, the universe is actually made up of dark matter. Right. And we can't see it. We can't touch it. We can't feel it. We don't kind of know what it does. We don't know why it, it exists. Yeah. So what am I to make of that? Well, that's actually a thrilling idea if you can wrap your mind around it. So you mind spending 30 seconds on yeah. dark matter yeah. just for the heck of it? So when we observe galaxies, we find that they're spinning around at such a rate that stars on the edge should be flung outward, sort of like water droplets on a bicycle wheel that's spinning fast, the water gets flung out. Yeah. But the stars aren't getting flung out. Something must be holding them in. We don't see anything that can do that, but we know gravity has the power to hold things together. So we imagine that maybe there's some matter out there that we don't see, dark matter, that's why we don't see it, it doesn't give off light, and that matter is exerting a gravitational pull holding those stars together in these spinning galaxies. And when we make that hypothesis, it explains observation so spectacularly well that we begin to gain confidence that maybe the stuff that we haven't yet seen and we haven't yet touched or smelled yet, maybe it's real. So we build big detectors and we try to capture one of these dark matter particles. We haven't succeeded yet, but I think that we will. So this is a beautiful example of how observations drive rational thinking to explain the facts and ultimately verify it through observation and experiment that can be replicated. That is what science is. And that is what can get your heart pounding when you realize that the human intellect can figure out things about the universe that you wouldn't expect based on casual observation.